Okay, tonight we're going to go ahead and start our session um, for tonight. Um, this session, we're going to dwell a little bit and go back where we started, when we started dealing with um, the doctrines of Christ, uh, which start, which come out of Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. But in prior classes, what we discussed was that as leaders, according to Hebrews, the latter part of Hebrews chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, let's tend there. We're going to have prayer real quick, and then we'll get into um, tonight's lesson. Okay, Hebrews, in the latter part of Hebrews, this is where our foundation is where we want to start from. Um, Hebrews chapter 5. Beginning at verse uh, 11, of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing, for when the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Everyone that uses milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, and he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And um, what we came to from this teaching was that in order, and remember this Bible study is geared toward ministry leaders and current ministry leaders and future ministry leaders. Um, what I want to say is that and you, you, when you become going to ministry and become a ministry leader, um, you're going to be a novice at some point, but it also says that when there's a time when you should be teaching, you have need to be taught. So what we're doing in this particular session, on this prior session as well, is we looked at Hebrews 5, we looked at uh, Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, then we came over to uh, Hebrews 5, um, 12 through 14. And so what we're doing now is we're going through Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, because before you can go on any further, you'll see in the scripture, you need to have a base as a ministry leader current or future, you need to have a basic understanding of what the doctrines of Christ are, Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. So therefore, in order for you to be a teacher, you need to get this teaching, so then at least you can move on from these basic foundational principles. Okay? So we're going to look at now, uh, before we go, we have prayer. Father, thank you tonight for your anointing and your power. I pray, Father God, that as this teacher goes forward, someone uh, learns something, they edify their spirit man, matures even more. We give your name, praise, honor, and glory in this place tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you turn your Bibles over to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, and what are we going to, there it says, leaving the principles of the doctrines, let us go on to perfection. That word perfection means maturity. Not laying again what? Here are the principles. The first one is found, uh, foundation of repentance from dead works. Uh, we discussed that those were the things that we do that were part of the old nature, the carnal flesh, before we were saved, before we became believers. The next one is faith towards God. Uh, in our study, we talked about how our faith towards God is based upon the atoning work that Jesus Christ did at Calvary by his death, burial, and resurrection. We're now reconciled by God, I think Romans, 20, Romans 3, 24, 25, and that the things he did reconciled. Um, us, not only us, but the whole creation back to God. So the next one we're going to talk about tonight is of the doctrine of baptisms. Okay, of the doctrine of baptisms. And there's a lot of discussion and um, confusion in the body, debate, um, whether it actually means when you're baptized, should you be sprinkled, should you be immersed, should you be dipped. And what I want to do is I like to use the Bible as the roadmap and Jesus as the one who sets the example. So at some point tonight, as time goes on, we're going to get to the scriptures, and we're going to see exactly was Jesus dipped, uh, was Jesus uh, immer immersed, or was just water sprinkled on Jesus' head. Amen. So first of all, that word baptized, we're going to look at it uh, from Matthew 3 and 6. If you turn your, to your Bibles and go to Matthew 3 and 6. Matthew 3 and 6. And it's also good to get your concordance and do a little study of these words in the Greek. Okay? Matthew 3 and 6 says, and were 
This is talking about John the Baptist. Um, you know, in those days, beginning at three, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, for there for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in, Ju in Jordan, confessing their sins. Okay, so this word here we see, this word baptized, the general we're going we're gonna to be working from, that word is baptized or baptizo from the Greek word bapto, has four meanings. One, to dip, to overwhelm with suffering, to bury, bury into, and it does not, regardless of the element used, it's going to mean the same thing. If you notice here in these particular scripture, in Mark, excuse me, Matthew 3 and 6, and they were baptized in Jordan, and with their baptism, they were just confessing their sin. They were not confessing Jesus Christ the same way we confess Jesus in Romans 10, uh, 9 and 10. If you look that up later, you'll see that scripture. Most of you should be familiar with that scripture. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about the seven baptisms in Scripture. The seven baptisms in Scripture. Okay, and the first one we're going to look at is John's baptism in water. We're looking here in Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, and we see that. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in the Jordan confessing their sins. So let's look at this. Who is the agent doing the baptizing? John is doing the baptizing. What are they being baptized in? The Jordan, which is water, which is a river. And what were they doing when they were baptized? They were confessing their sins, not confessing Jesus Christ, not believing that God raised him from the dead. Uh, not, none of that had taken place yet. Jesus was still alive. Jesus was still on the earth. So here, their baptism is just a baptism of repentance. They're repenting from their sins when they were baptized. This <clears throat> does not give them salvation because remember, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming through the Father except by Him. Okay? That's the first baptism. The next baptism we're going to see is Jesus Christ's baptism in water. The first one is John's baptism in water, where John is baptizing people as they came to him to the Jordan, they're being baptized in the Jordan, which is water, and they're confessing their sins. The next we're going to look at Mark 1 and 9. Okay? Mark 1 and 9. Excuse me for a second. Okay, Mark 1 and 9. Let's go to Mark 1 and 9. Okay, 1 and, one and 9 says, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. Okay? So Jesus comes down to John and gets baptized. But let's go a little further and let's go down. Look at 10. And straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. What I want to look at here is in verse 10, Mark 1 and 10. You remember I was saying earlier how there's a lot of confusion and debate of whether or not you should be dipped, whether or not you should be sprinkled, um, or whether or not um, how you should be baptized. Well, it says here in the Bible, and straightway coming up what? Out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descend upon him. That means that Jesus 
came up out of the water. That means he had to be under the water. So, to clarify, since there's no clarification, or there's always a constant debate when you sprinkle, um, however the case may be, we want to use Jesus' example of what Jesus did to be baptized. The Bible says that straightway, coming up what? Out of the water, he saw the heavens open, and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. So Jesus Christ was emerged under the water, completely under the water, and then he came up. So for, for me, when it talks about how I should be baptized, or how you should be baptized, or how um, we should baptize as men and women of God, we should immerse in water and then bring, bring people up. Okay? That's number two, Christ baptism. Okay, the next one is going to be the baptism into suffering. Baptism into suffering. Let's look at Mark 10.38. Mark 10.38. Okay. Mark 10.38. Okay, it says, But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with, with all shall ye be baptized. The Amplified Version says, for Mark 10, 38 says, and this is the part where James and John uh, are wanting to, you know, who can sit on his left side or right. And she said, you know, what would he do for them? And they said they want to sit on his right hand and one on the other side. And then Jesus went ahead and went into this, this scripture. Uh, Mark 10, 38, Amplified Version says, but Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink that I drink or be baptized with the baptism of affliction with which I am baptized with, or the baptism of suffering? Now, what are we talking about when Jesus talks about, or we're talking about this baptism of suffering? Remember here um, how Jesus, prior to him going to the cross um, in the garden, we see that Peter, Peter tries to stop Jesus again by cutting off the um, cutting off the ear of the servant. And what does Jesus do then? Jesus tells him, "No, put that away. Um, it's not time for that yet." So Jesus is basically saying, "If you can't stop me, don't stop me from going through my suffering. Don't stop me from fulfilling my purpose and destiny." So Jesus had to be baptized unto that suffering prior to the cross. When they beat him, then he goes to the cross, and he's hanging on the cross suffering, and then he gives up the ghost. Let's look at Luke 24 and 26. Luke 24 and 26. Luke 24 and 26. We're going to talk about the baptism of suffering or into suffering. Luke 24 and 26. Okay, and it says, I'm, I'm starting at 25, Then said they unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? So in order for Christ to enter into his glory, he had to suffer. His suffering began when they captured him, when they beat him, and when they hung him on the cross. That was his suffering. Okay, so now you see this baptism of the suffering. Let's look over at Acts 3 18. Acts 3 and 18. Another scripture. Okay. Acts 
Acts 3 and 18 says, we'll start at 17, and now, brother, I would, I want that through ignorance she did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of what? All his prophets that Christ should what? Should suffer, he have, he have so fulfilled. So Jesus Christ had to have a baptism of suffering. We see that here in these scriptures. And also, briefly go to, look at John 18, 11. John 18, 11. And this is where Jesus himself is going to give clarification that he has to do this. He has to suffer. Okay, John 18, 11. And remember now, this is when they're in the garden. He said, Jesus, I told you, this is verse 8. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Um, no, let's go back up to 5. They answered him, we're in uh, John 18, 5. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus said unto them, unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let, th let these go their way, that the same might be fulfilled which he spake, of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having his sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant, servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it. What is this cup? This is suffering. He had to suffer for us on the cross. Okay, so you see this baptism of suffering in Mark 38. Jesus speaks about this cup that he had to drink. In 1811, he also talks in Mark, uh, when he talks to the James and John who want to get elevated, isn't that something? I wonder if that still happens in ministry today. He explains to them, could they be baptized in the same baptism he was going to be able to be baptized in? And could they drink the cup that he was going to drink of? Okay? That's the baptism of suffering. The next baptism we're going to talk about is baptism in the cloud and sea. Baptism in the cloud and sea, 1 Corinthians 10 and 2. And again, what I want to reiterate is that you should take time to study these out, these doctrines out, and get a basic understanding of Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Because if you're going to teach and minister the Word of God, if you do a, 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 just a basic study of everything that Jesus said, Jesus is always at some point coming back to these doctrines, these basic principles. And what happens in the New Testament church, we're supposed to get these basic foundational teachings, and then we're supposed to head into the epistles and how we're supposed to treat each other, how we're supposed to love each other, how if, there's, we have a, if we have a, a situation in the local church, how we're supposed to handle it, how we're not supposed to take um, another brother or sister to an unrighteous judge, how husbands are supposed to treat their wives, wives submit to their husbands, children obey their parents. All these other things are added in the epistles so that we might go on to what? A state of what? Perfection or a state of maturity. Okay? Remember that. Baptism in the cloud and sea. 1 Corinthians 10 and 2. 1 Corinthians 10 and 2. And if anyone's on the phone, if you want to jump in and have a comment, you're more than welcome, you're more than welcome at any time. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 2. We'll start with verse 1. Um, and we'll go down to 4. 10, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be what? Ignorant. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But look back at what all too. And were all baptized unto Moses in the what? In the cloud and in the sea. The amplified version of this, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 and 2, reads as thus. 
and each one of them allowed himself also to be baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They were thus brought under obligation to the law, to Moses, and to the covenant, consecrated and set apart to the service of God. Same scripture from the Message Bible. All our ancestors were led by the provincial cloud and taken miraculously through the sea. They went through the waters in a baptism like ours, as Moses led them from enslaving death to salvation life. Okay? I like that. I, what I like about in the Amplified, it talks about how they were, because they were baptized, they were brought on the obligation to the law, to Moses, and to the covenant, consecrated and set apart to the service of the cloud. What I also like about the message Bible that gives me good understanding and clarification, it said, as Moses led them from enslaving death to salvation life. And we know that for us, water baptism is just an outward sign that we've made a confession of the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and believed in our heart that God raised him from the dead. And it's just an outward symbolic um, thing that we do to show that we believe that and we're just being baptized. And we're going to see that later on, how people are, you know, the water baptism, how that, back, we, you know, when we confess Christ, we're baptized into his body as, as a member of the body of Christ. But I want you also to understand that if you never get baptized, that does not mean you're not saved. And if you never confess Jesus Christ, and you, as your Lord and Savior, according to Romans 10, 9 and 10, and you get baptized without doing that, you're not saved. You just got put in water. It has no spiritual meaning. A lot of churches will let, you know, let people join who never confessed Christ, who never acknowledged with a confession of their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believed in their heart that God raised him from the dead. They're not saved. They just got baptized. When you baptize, just baptize people in water, just to be doing it because we, they think it's a religious thing to do and they've not confessed Jesus Christ, it does not mean they're saved. It does not mean that they're a, body of the, a part of the body of Christ. What brings you into the body of Christ is when you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Now you're in the body of Christ. Okay? Any questions or comments from phone? Yeah. Yeah, Pastor Garner's on the line. What she said was a good point as well is that, uh, um, you know, a lot of people believe that, you know, they say that the age of 12 is the age of consent or knowledge, whatever, for the body of Christ, and that people get baptized at 12. It doesn't, even if you get baptized at the age of 12 and you've not confessed or don't have an understanding or meaning of what, that you confess Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ with your mouth, and believe in the heart that God raised, it has nothing to do with you. are just being baptized. You're just being placed in water and pulled back out. It does not, it has no spiritual meaning whatsoever. It's just something that churches do and people do. You have adults who get baptized, who are in church, who never confessed the Lord Jesus Christ or believed in their heart that God raised them from the dead. That has, it has, it means nothing. You're just getting wet. In order, again, I want to, I want to really, you know, push this home. The two points that I really want to push tonight in the banking pass garden is one, that we see um, how Jesus came straightway out the water. Let's use Jesus as an example for what baptism is. If Jesus came straightway out the water, that means he was down in the water, number one. Number two, you cannot baptism without confessing the Lord Jesus Christ and believing in your heart that God raised him has no meaning for you if you don't do that. You have to do that to be saved and come into the body of Christ. Thank you, Pastor Gardner, for that, that comment. Okay, so we saw that was the baptism into the cloud and sea of Moses. And, and I want to say, based upon those two, um, the, the, the Message Bible and the Amplified Bible, I want to say, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not saying this is Holy Ghost 
revelation. I'm saying this is what I just read and a part of my understanding. You can take it however you want to take it. Is that when we can when we um, when we confess the Lord Jesus Christ and then we um, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we are now obligated to follow the rules, protocols, principles, and doctrines of Christ. That's part of our responsibility and obligation. See, you know, a lot of people confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in their heart, but they don't understand what they've done. They don't understand that they're obligated to live by the instructions that the Holy Ghost instructs via the Bible with interpretation through apostles, prophets, um, evangelists, pastors, teachers. You're now obligated. This is, so you're in the kingdom. You are now, you've now come into the kingdom of God. And when you come into the kingdom of God, you have to follow the rules and regulations of the kingdom. It's like when you become a citizen of certain states or certain countries, they have, they have rules, regulations that are, that are particular to that particular state and or country. So when you come into the body of Christ, to, again, I'm stressing this over and over again, that you have to confess the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart that God raised him dead. Now you're saved. There are rules and regulations that, that are peculiar in particular, specifically to this particular kingdom. We're obligated to follow those principles and protocols and rules of the kingdom. Not being religious, but those, whatever the Bible instructs us to do, these are the things that we have to do, whether we want to do them or not. These are the things that we have to do. We, have a free, we are free will agents to do what we want to do, but we should follow the rules of the kingdom. And when you follow the rules of the kingdom, that enables God to bless you and do other things in your life that would normally not happen without you following the rules. Because if you won't follow the rules, you're in rebellion. You're a lawbreaker. I don't want to stick that. That's just heavy tonight for me. So just let's make sure that when we confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart, we understand also we're obligated to follow the rules. The way that interpretation said they were obligated to follow the law for that period of time, Moses, who was the leader, and the covenant that God has then made. We're, we're obligated to do that. Amen? Okay, let's look at the fifth baptism. Okay, let's look at the fifth baptism. And the fifth baptism is going to be Christian baptism in water. Christian baptism in water. What does that mean? I want to say believer's baptism in water because all Christians don't believe in the Bible. Okay? Christian baptism in water. Let's go to Matthew 28, 19. Matthew 28, 19. Okay, we get to Matthew 28, 19. If you have a Bible that has it in red, it's going to see that this is, this is Jesus speaking. You know, normally we have a Bible and, it, and it's in red. Jesus is doing the speaking. Okay? So let's look. We're going to start at verse 18. Uh, this is normally what people call the Great Commission. That this is Jesus giving instructions on what uh, the believers, disciples, apostles after him were supposed to, that he left, uh, that he had trained, taught up. He's given his instructions. The Great Commission. This is, what the, the, this is what the church is supposed to be doing. The church is not going to be having bake sale, car washes, um, spend a lot of time in conferences for money. The church is supposed to be doing this great commission. Let's see what the great commission is. And part of that great commission is to baptize in water, not immerse, not sprinkle. Jesus was not immersed, Jesus was not sprinkled with water. Jesus was not dipped in water. Jesus was immersed in water. He came straight away out of the water. Matthew 28, beginning at verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Okay, so let's look at this. First of all, I want, to read, I want to read the message version of Matthew 28, 19. And then we're going to go back and talk about this King James Version a little bit more. 
The, the message verse says, go out and train everyone you meet, far and near, in this way of life. What is this way of life? The believer's way of life. Marking them by baptism in the threefold name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, there is much debate in, in religious circles of do we baptize in the name of the Father? Do we baptize in the name of the Son? Do we baptize in the name of the Holy Spirit? You're going to see over in the book of Acts that they just baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. The book of Acts says we're going to see it that they just baptize. Does it really make a difference? As long as you confess the Lord Jesus Christ with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and then you get baptized, you're getting baptized in the Father's name, you're getting baptized in Jesus' name, you're getting baptized. Aren't they one? Aren't they the same? What is the big argument and debate if a person confesses the Lord Jesus with their mouth and believes in their heart that God, why is there a big debate of how you, what name they should be baptized in? Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptize them in the name of the Father. Baptize them in the name of Jesus. Baptize them in the name of the Holy Spirit. They're being baptized, into, they're being baptized as an outward show that they believe what they confess and what they believe in their heart. I personally say baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because that's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said, dude. Jesus said, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Let's just baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's what's in red, and be done with it and move on. Because we spend a lot of time arguing about issues like this when it's clearly in the Bible in red. Then we start all these confusions with the people that we're baptizing, and then that they're confused. Now we start this confusion. Let's just follow what the Bible says. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. Remember what I was saying earlier about once we get baptized, now we're obligated to be to follow the rules and regulations of the kingdom. This is what Jesus says. Baptize and live in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then he says, do what? Teaching them to what? Observe all things, whatever I have commanded you. He's commanded us to teach them the things that he's teaching. To teach them the things that he's saying. Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So when people come into the body, we're obligated to teach them what the Bible says. Not our personal opinions. We can say, you know, this is what I think, but more so our teaching should be based upon the Bible. Paul in one of the cases said, you know, the Holy Spirit didn't tell me this. I'll just tell you what I think it is. But, you know, you can take it for what it is. But most, the, our teaching should come from the Bible. As the Holy Spirit um, inspired the writers to write it, let's do that. That way there's no confusion. If we stick with the Bible, you know, we can, we can share our personal thoughts on issues. I don't see, think there's anything wrong as long as they line up with the Word of God. We can't be going far left and far right and getting all these crazy doctrines that have been established in the local church in the body of Christ. Amen? Pastor Garner, anything from you? Amen. Okay? All right. The next baptism is baptism into Christ and into his body. Let's go look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verses 12, excuse me, 13 to 14. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13 through 14. And see, if you're, if you're a ministry, if you're a current ministry leader or future ministry leader, this is why I, I, really, I really press Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Because if you spend time and study out Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, you are going to learn so much more other than just the doctrine. Because in the process of studying these doctrines, you're going to see so much more in the Bible of what Christ did. The totality of what happened at Calvary. When you study it out. That's the word we use. When you study it out. You just don't read it. You study it out. You take time to dissect it and read it and get your concordance out. And um, if you don't understand it in the King James, maybe look, look at it the Amplified Version. If you don't understand the Amplified Version, maybe look at the Message. But take the time to study it out, to get an understanding 
of what actually the Bible is saying, and not just what it's saying, but what was taking place at that particular time, and how it's relevant to us, relevant to us today in the in the New Testament church. Okay. First Corinthians chapter twelve, verses thirteen and fourteen. Okay, so look what it says. It says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Watch this. For by what? One spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. 13 again. For by one spirit we are what? All baptized into what? One body. What body are we baptized into? We say it all the time. The body of Christ. Then it gives further, further clarification. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all and have been all made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but what? Many. So all of those or all of us who have confessed the Lord Jesus Christ, believe that God raised him dead, by the Spirit we've been baptized into the body of Christ. Because this body is not one member, it's many members. And to give you the more clarification, then it talks about whether we be what? Jews or Gentiles, whether we be what? Bond or free. We have all we have been all made to drink into the in, into the one. Okay? Go over to um, Galatians 3 and 27 real quick. Galatians 3 and 27. See, a lot of people, a lot of people say, okay, a lot of people say, well, I'm a part of the body of Christ. Well, do you know what that means to say I'm a part of the body of Christ? How did you get into the body of Christ? The scripture just told us how we got into it. But see, when you're a ministry leader, when you're teaching and preaching, you need to have an understanding of what you're teaching and preaching and just saying it. And a lot of people just say stuff or they mimic what they've heard other people say without knowing whether it's scripture correct or not. Or with sound doctrine, sound teaching. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 says, Watch, uh oh, watch this right here. For as many of you as have been what? Baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. For, listen to this, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, uh, the Amplified Version says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ, into a spiritual union and communion with Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, have put on, clothed yourselves with Christ. That means we're back, we're emerged in Him, we're part of Him, we're in there. The message says, your baptism in Christ was not just washing you up for a fresh start. It also involved dressing you in an adult faith wardrobe, Christ's life, the fulfillment of God's original promise. Your baptism in Christ was not just washing you up for a fresh start. It also involved dressing you in an adult faith wardrobe, Christ's life, the fulfillment of God's original promise. Isn't that something? That we're all baptized into Christ, but not, we're not just baptizing him, we are in communion with him. We are clothed in a faith wardrobe, which is Christ's life. What was Christ's life? Christ's life was the fulfillment of all God's original promises. Christ came back and restored all those promises to mankind and to the creation that God originally 
gave to man, but we lost when sin came in in the fall. In Genesis. Pastor Garner, anything from you on that? That's good meat right there, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Because again, it, 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 this, you know, I, I, I like to say this. When, you, when you're studying something out, you have to study that. You have to take the time and look at the different scriptures. Look at the different versions. Each one can say something, uh, translations, um, that you can get a better understanding. A lot of people say to me, well, I really don't understand the King James Version. It's too hard for me to understand a lot of these, thou's, and they's. Okay, that's fine. Look at the Amplified Version. Uh, look at the uh, Living New Living Translation. Look at the Message Bible. Look at those different translations and bring them back to the King James and just look at what it says so you can get a better understanding. I would rather you, you know, just reading it and studying out and being confused. I want you to get an understanding. Get an understanding to where you are, where you can understand it, and that you can teach it, that you can live it. Make it easier for yourself. Don't make it so complicated. Amen? Yes, the Amplified is actually the King James. I believe, you know what, Pastor, Pastor Garner is saying that when you, they be, the Amplified Version is an excellent version, King, another version of the King James, just as good. I believe for me, you know, I, I, initially I wasn't a, a great fan of the Amplified or the Message, but as, the more I study things out, the more I read, the more I dedicate more uh, time to study of the Word, I see that those, those three versions work well for me. The King James, I'm always going to be a King James person. But I do like to amplify and I do like the message because there are some scriptures that I read and I've been reading for years that I have I never got a complete understanding of. But now when I sit down and I look at my King James, my Amplified, and my message, I have a better understanding. It, it, it brings clarity. It brings light to those scriptures. Amen? Okay, the last... What, what Pastor Garner is saying is that, yeah, what Pastor Garner is saying that for young adults and a lot of younger people, the King James is hard to read. And that if they looked at the Amplified, the Amplified um, breaks scripture down or has scripture in a more contemporary style, a more contemporary language that people can understand. Amen? New Living Translation. Excuse me, she said the New Living Translation. Is a more contemporary style and brings it more um, on the level for you. younger people. Were you saying young adults? Uh, young adults. Okay, let's look at number the last of the seven baptisms in the Bible, and the last one is going to be. Uh, but we're still going to talk about a couple more things. The last is going to be baptism in the Holy Spirit. Baptism in the Holy Spirit. Um. Let's look at Luke 3.16. We're going to look at about three different scriptures here. Luke 3.16. Matthew, Mark, Luke 3.16. Okay, Luke 3. John answers saying unto them, all. I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the lashes of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with what? With the Holy Ghost and fire. So that's the next one. Baptism in the Holy Ghost. 
He shall baptize you with Holy Ghost, with the Holy Ghost and fire. Let's look at John 1, 33 through 34. John 1, 33 through 34. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize of water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remain on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. He's talking about Jesus. Okay? He's talking about Jesus. So the baptism of the Holy Ghost is for believers. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, that the you don't need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, yes, you do. If you don't get baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're not saved. No, that's not true. So there's, salvation comes very simply through this. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and thou shalt be saved. All these other things that we're talking about tonight are bonuses, are extras. It's like you're getting a new job. It's like getting a new car. You get a car, and you, the car is transportation, but isn't it nice to have air conditioning? Isn't it nice to have power windows? Now is it nice to have GPS? Same thing with um, the Baptist Holy Spirit. It endures you with power. It's, it endures you for service. That's why Jesus told them, don't go anywhere. Tarry until you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Until you receive what? Power. It's always talking about power. Power for service. That's why a lot of believers are, are, stay, are always defeated. They have no power in their life. They don't understand that. They think, okay, well, I don't need it. You do need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You do need the baptism of, with the evidence of speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. Jude says, how do you build your faith? Jude says, by praying in what? The Holy Ghost. You cannot pray in the Holy Ghost without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Build your faith. You have weak faith. You are always confused, double-minded, unstable, wandering like the book of James says. Double-minded. Get the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Pray in tongues and build your faith. Build your faith. Build your faith. Faith just doesn't come, you know, I'm talking about faith you know, by hearing and hearing the word of God. Okay, so faith cometh, but how do you build your faith? By praying in the Holy Ghost. Okay? By praying in the Holy Ghost. All right, now, we talked about seven different baptisms tonight. The first one was John's baptism, and that's where John was baptized in water for the repentance, for the repentance of sins, confession. And if you notice in three, Matthew 5, 3, 5, and 6, they were getting baptized. And they were confessing their sins, not Jesus. So they were just doing a bat, they were just bat, getting baptized um, with repentance. And if you look over, we're going to see later in a few minutes that Paul talks about, well, what have you heard? Well, we got baptized with John's baptism of repentance. Then Jesus, he talks about the baptism, water baptism. They get another baptism, the, you know, the, well, I'm going to say the next bat level of baptism. And then they get back, they get filled with the baptized in the Holy Ghost. We'll get ready to go there in one second. The next one we discussed was Christ's baptism in water. How he, he didn't, he was not sprinkled, he was not dipped. It says that he straightway he came what? Up out of the water. That means he was under the water. He wasn't on top of it. He wasn't dipped. He was immersed under the water. Under the water he went, and straightway out of the water he came. And that's for me is how we should baptize. Put them under, bring them out. Amen. Uh, number three, baptism in the suffering. That Jesus Christ had all scripture had to be fulfilled. That he had to suffer. He was baptized in the suffering. He said, can you take this baptism that I'm going to be baptized in? Can you drink from this cup that I'm going to drink it from? Okay. Then we see, that was number four, is a baptism in the cloud and sea with Moses. How the cloud... By uh, how the cloud, they saw the cloud, they were baptized in the cloud, they were baptized in the sea. 1 Corinthians 10 and 2. Then we see the uh, Christian baptism or believer's baptism into water. 
not sprinkled, not not uh, a little thorn of water, not dipped, but not dipped, but put under the water and brought back up. That's how baptism should take place according to what Jesus did. Let's do what Jesus did. Okay. Number six was the baptism into Christ and to His body according to First Corinthians twelve thirteen through fourteen. We also see that in Galatians three twenty seven. We looked at the King James Amplified, well, the Amplified in the Message versions of that. The last one we saw was the baptism in the Holy Spirit or the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Okay, how that you know Jesus says that we should be baptized in the Holy Ghost that we have power. That 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 power is for service in the kingdom. Okay. And now as New Testament believers or believers now of these baptisms, three are specifically for us. We can't be baptized. We can't be baptized in the cloud, in the deceit. That's done. But what we're going to look at is one, the first one is when we confess Christ as our Lord and Savior and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, now we're what? We are now baptized into Christ what? Into the body of Christ. Okay? Into Christ or into his body and repentance and the new birth. Ephesians 4 and 5 calls this one baptism. But because it is the only baptism that saves the soul and brings one into the body of Christ. Let's look at Ephesians 4 and 5. Now we're going to talk about, of the seven that we talked about, we're just going to talk about a little bit before we close out, the three baptisms for believers. So the first one is when we, can, when we confess Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. Now, that is, we are now baptized into Christ or into his body. That's the new birth experience. But let's look at, Ephesians calls this one baptism. Let's go to Ephesians 4 and 5. Ephesians 4 and 5. Okay? Uh, we're going to start at we're going to start at one Ephesians four and one down um, probably to six. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Let me stop right there. Remember earlier I was saying how after we get you know once we get a, a understanding of the doctrines of Christ Hebrews six one and two once we understand that now we need to move move further. Uh, in our walk and in our teaching with the things that come in the epistles or the, or the New Testament writings. Now here's one that we just see right here. He says, um, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, he says, excuse me, uh, beginning at verse 1, 4 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another love. See, now once you understand these doctrines, you can go on and now and understand that with lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. You've got to be taught these things. And you're obligated to follow these things. We're obligated to, to understand what our vocation is. And to do it with lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. This is not a could, maybe, would you please do it? This is what we should be doing. Here we go. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. In the bond of peace. Why? Look, there is one body and one spirit. Even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. What is that baptism? It is when you confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You are now baptized into that body. One Lord, one faith. One baptism. Out of the baptisms, this is the one that they're talking about because you can't get it, you know, you can't any of the other ones. You can get baptized in water and not believe about the Lord or have faith, but it does you any good without confessing the Lord Jesus Christ and believe it. This is talking about your baptism into the body of Christ with your confession and your belief of the confession of the Lord Jesus Christ and the belief in your heart. And you have anything on that, uh, Pastor Garner? I said, do you have anything on that? Okay. All right. So we see that. So the next one, the first one is 
to be, the first one is proclaiming to us is to be baptized into Christ into his body. The next one is water baptism after one is saved. That's important. Now, let me say this. Again, I want to clarify that wa water baptism is not necessary to be saved. Or if you get saved by confessing the Lord Jesus Christ, believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you never get water baptized, it does not mean you're not saved. It does not mean you're not in the body. It just means that you have never been baptized in water, given an outward show of like what Christ did. That's all it means. Some people say, well, I've never been baptized in water. And people say, well, you're not saved. Not true. You are saved if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead. You're saved. Water baptism is an extra, it's just an outward sign that you believe what you confess, you, you, you understand what you confess, you believe in your heart, and that's what Jesus did, and you just want to follow in his footsteps and path. Amen? Okay? Number three, spirit baptism. The first one for new to, uh, as believers is baptism. You're going to get that. Once you confess the Lord Jesus Christ with your mouth, believe in your heart, that God raised it, you get that automatically. You're in the Bible. The next one is voluntarily. Do you want to be baptized with water? Should you be baptized with water? Absolutely. It's just an outward show that you believe your confession and believe in your heart. You, can, you concur with it. And the next one is spirit baptism. The endurement of power for service. Now, we're going to look at scripture. This can take place either before water baptism or after water baptism. We're going to look at scripture and look at this. The baptism of the Holy Spirit can take place prior to water baptism or after water baptism. Now, is that a requirement for salvation? No, it's not. But again, you want power in your life. Jesus said, and the Bible says, after you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you should receive what? Power. Dunamis power. Okay? So, first baptism for believers is what we, what we talk about. The first is what? Baptism into Christ's body. We become a member of the body of Christ. When we confess our mouth and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and raise the dead, in our heart. Number two, water baptism, where we're submerged, put under the water, and brought straight away up out of the water. Outward sign that we, that we concur with what we confess and what we believe in our heart. And the next one is spirit baptism, where we're baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues that the Spirit gives utterance, that's what the Bible says, as well as this can take place before water baptism or after water baptism. Okay, so let's go to, just to clarify this about the spirit baptism before water or after water, let's go to Acts 19. Acts chapter 19. See, and a lot of people didn't probably know this, that you can get the Holy Spirit before your water baptized or after your baptism, or after water baptism. Most people probably believe, well, before I can, there's, there's this rigid, there's this rigid protocol that I have to go through. No, the only thing you have to do to be saved is confess the Lord Jesus Christ with your mouth. And believe that God raised him from the dead. And you're saved. That's what the Bible says. Now the others are extra. Benefits, bonuses of your salvation experience.